Our final storyteller tonight is a founder of Gender Fork. She's a former queer open mic uh, MC. She opened our first East Bay body, and now she here, she's here on stage to be our final storyteller tonight. Please give a big welcome to Sarah Dopp. God damn, this is fun. I like it here. And you know, I know the theme was winning, but how about all them queer stories? That was fucking awesome. I got another one for you. All right, well, it's more of a techie story. So one day I get locked on my Twitter account. I like really locked out, like forgot password is not helping me, I'm screwed. And it sucks, so I blog about it. And most of the commenters are empathizing, saying, oh my god, Twitter, blah, blah, blah. One commenter starts to give me ideas on how I can fix it, starts to give me ideas on how I can prove to Twitter that I own the account through third party apps and stuff like that. And then she leaves a second comment saying that she has friends in the tech industry who might know Twitter employees, who might be able to vouch for me that I own the account. It was generous, it was creative, it was technical, and I had no idea who this person was. So I Googled her. Her name was Meredith. I could tell from Flickr that we knew some of the same people because she was in pictures with them. She was at a tech conference that I'd been to, except at a different year than me. I'd never met her. I also could tell that she lived in Australia, in Sydney. She was Australian, far away, and that she was trans. And she had documented her transition, or the beginning of it, from male to female publicly on a blog. Um, but that blog had not uh, continued because there were lots of links to it, except that it didn't exist anymore at all. It was the internet equivalent of a black hole. No cash, no way back machine, nothing. So I'm intrigued. And I respond publicly with, hey, thank you so much for that comment. That was really great. And then I send her an email, because I've got her email address, because she left a comment on my blog. And I say, oh my god, we know the same people. Who are you? You look so interesting. Why don't I know you yet? Why are you commenting? Who are you? You're amazing. <laughs> and fortunately, she likes to talk about herself even more than I do, so she writes me back this really long email with her story. And the short version is that when she started to transition, a part of her thought that she would never be fully accepted for who she was in her personal life and her daily life. So she started a blog to kind of build up an army of readers and supporters and community that could help her through the hard stuff. And that worked until she got tired of talking about being trans and she deleted the blog. And she went into a year of social hibernation in which she dealt with a whole lot of surgeries and changing her life. And she was passing as a woman and um, she just needed to take a break from people. She'd been reading my blog for six months, but this was the first time she'd commented on anything in a long time. So we became pen pals. And we started writing every day really long letters about our lives and what was going on. And we were talking about gender and identity and internet and sexuality and presentation online and all this stuff that I'm super geeky obsessed with. And she was too. And I'm like, this is really cool. And somewhere in this conversation, she let it slip that she hadn't had sex yet with her new vagina. So I took that as a challenge and started giving her advice on how to meet people. And the more I talked about it, the more I realized that she really shouldn't have her first time with someone that she picks up at a bar. It should be with someone that she knows, that she can trust, that respects her, that likes her a lot. <laughs> so I told my work I'd be out on Friday and Monday, but you know, available by email, just working from home, and I hopped a fucking plane to motherfucking Australia <laughs> for a weekend booty call. <laughs> and then I realized this was a terrible idea. <laughs> I get like, I get weird when I promise sex, you know, like when. <laughs> I get deer in headlights about it. Like, I'll show up and I'll be like, all right, I'm going to do this. And then something doesn't feel right. And I'm not sure if it's the right idea. And then I just get, you know, really, I feel bad about it. I don't want to hurt their feelings. And I don't know what to do. And on the way there, I was already feeling that, like, oh my god, what am I getting into? I'm flying across the country for a like life-changing experience with like a literally born-again virgin. <laughs> and you know when you have just a picture of someone, you fill in all these other details about how they move and how they sound. And you know that you're making them up. <laughs> 
And then you meet them and like the specificity of the detail is almost grotesque of how they're actually real. She had, she was tall, she had bright red hair, she had big eyes and they were like painted with heavy makeup and she had broad shoulders and high breasts and this smile on her face that looked like I was about to save her life. And I was terrified. It took me about halfway through the ride home back to her place to realize that she was a lot more terrified than I was. So we stopped and got dinner and talked about it. And I was like, you know, I, I just really am glad to see you. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm nervous. I don't want to promise you anything, but I'm just glad I'm here. And she said, you know what? You're going to sleep in my bed. I'm going to sleep on the couch. I'm really glad you're here. So we were cool. And we started talking, and it was just like the emails. We just geeked out about everything. So when she's preparing my bed, her bed for me, I just plopped down on it, and I spread out my arms, and I was like, hey, come on. And she looked at me questioningly. I was like, I just want hugs. So she got into the bed. And then cuddling turned into nuzzling. And nuzzling turned into snuggling. And snuggling turned into making out naked with my hand inside her, rubbing her to an orgasm. And all of a sudden, it was going to be an awesome weekend. <laughs> her vagina was beautiful and impressive. <laughs> I kept staring at her while I was going down on her, going, wow, modern science. <laughs> it was made out of the same tissue and nerves as her penis, but they've been rearranged to make a clitoris and a G-spot. And it didn't have all the same folds and bumps as mine, but the skin felt about the same. And it tasted sweeter. And it didn't self-lubricate. We had to use a lot of lube. But um, she still had a prostate. How many people get to stimulate a prostate from a vagina? It was like Christmas down there. <laughs> Um, so, so the first night we just kind of, I used my hands and my mouth and we explored and it was beautiful and it was sweet. The second night, after we'd driven around Sydney in her convertible being all super flirty and girlfriendy all day long, I got changed in her room by myself before she came in. And I pulled out the strap-on that I had bought specifically for this trip. And I had never used a strap-on before. I had never touched a strap-on before. I wrestled my way into the strap-on. <laughs> and when she walked in, her face got serious. And she walked up to me, and she knelt down in front of me and wrapped her lips around it and started sucking a lot. And it was so hot. I had no idea how hot that could be. I, I didn't know that it was for me, too. It was. <laughs> and so I just leaned back and had my hand on her head, and it was amazing. And when I couldn't take it anymore, I moved her back onto the bed and grabbed the lube. And when my cock entered her, her face looked shocked. And I'm pretty sure mine did, too. <laughs> Um, I still didn't know how hips were supposed to work in that position, so that took some figuring. So I started really slow and moved really, like, you know, seriously and just kind of, we were just feeling it, just feeling each other out. And I started to move a little harder, I figured that out, and we stayed there for a while, just going in and out and checking in and stuff. And then finally I figured out how to go fast. <laughs> And her face just like lit up and she dug her fingers into my back and screamed and then looked at me really seriously and went, oh my God, thank you. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And I like started to slow down and she grabbed my head and she's like, no, keep going. I want to find out what this thing can do. <laughs> harder and slow, but just feeling it out. And when she came a second time, I looked at her questioningly and she said, again. <laughs> like, okay, so I kept fucking her and I went harder and I was pretty sure she was done at the third time and she looked at me and she said, no, keep going. <laughs> so, you know, my cock wasn't getting soft anytime soon. So I got up on my knees and just pushed through it. <laughs> and I brought her to a fourth screaming orgasm. And then a fifth. And then a sixth. And then a seventh. And I looked at her. And she said, keep going. 
But she wasn't in the same state. She was delirious. She was hysterical. She was panting. She was covered in sweat. And I knew for her own good she shouldn't keep going, or at least I couldn't keep going much longer. So I knew I had one more in me. So I gave her everything I had. I pulled it all, and I wanted her to have the most explosive, wonderful, vaginal experience. And <laughs> And I just went at it. And when she came, it was with the loudest scream. And her face was all twisted up in her body. And she had this horrified look. And she was sobbing. And I thought I hurt her. So I tried to get her to look at me. And when she did, she said, it's like the past never happened. And I tried to tell her I understood. I really did. But at that point, I had no more words. So here's to winning, everybody. Thank you.